Howdy folks, welcome back to Steampunk Death Spiral channel. Today I'm going to talk about a topic that I've been promising to do for some time now, artificial intelligence or AI, specifically AI in science fiction, but also with the viewpoint of someone who has actually been working with AI in real life. That's right, I've been doing some of this in my day job. And although I can't say anything specific, and to do so would probably bore you anyway, <laughs> I can't offer my opinion on how realistic some of these things are. Science fiction has long been obsessed with the idea of creating an artificial mind, you know, a mind in the image of man, uh, to quote Frank Herbert in Dune. Before that, magicians would talk about, you know, summoning spirits. But I don't remember if there's anybody who's been was talking about you know, actually creating a mind. And I think one of the first was probably Mary Shelley with Frankenstein. Because Frankenstein was a new person, even though he was made out of dead bodies. And Frank, the monster, that is. Not the, doc, not the doctor. Everybody confuses the two. So maybe that was the first. I don't know. So there's always these ideas of intelligent robots throughout science fiction. And I'm not going to talk about that this time. I've already talked about robots. Right now, I want to talk about a kind of a separate mind, a computer mind, almost godlike in the sense that it's not really corporeal. That's the distinction I'm going to make right now. Even though, yeah, there's lots of great stories where the robots do have intelligence. Robots or clones or whatever artificial entity you want to think about, you know, like in Blade Runner, for example. But no, right now, I think the thing to talk about is AI in the sense of a computer, a intelligent, sentient, really powerful computer. So, many of us steampunk writers model our works on Victorian fiction, but there's not that much about AI in those, maybe because it really wasn't an idea that you heard about too much in the Victorian era. However, however, the very first mention of it did happen back then, and that was in Samuel Butler's anti-dystopian or satirical dystopian novel, Erwan. <laughs> Erwan being an anagram of the word nowhere. This was published way back in 1872. And in this book, they had these intelligent machines that evolved, you know, Darwinically, <laughs> according to Darwin. And, you know, that was a big deal, a new discovery back then. So they evolved to become more powerful than the people. So what happened in this land of Erwan is they banned all machines because they were too afraid of them at this point. They thought, oh, they're going to evolve and replace us. The common thought you hear today, who's very prescient. <laughs> I haven't read Erwan yet. I will. reason I didn't read it, I was, I was actually confusing it with Edward Bellamy's 1888 book, Looking Backward, which is an actual straight-up utopia that was, was actually, people say it's boring. <laughs> As a lot of utopias are, so uh, eventually I'll get to it. The way I see it, there are basically three variants of AI in fiction. And it's in you know, a kind of a spectrum from evil to good. And since that's a, that's a definition, you know, definition of evil and good are something that don't really exist in the universe, they refer to people. How does it affect people? And so in that sense, I'd say there are three major divisions of AIs, and some are, you know, there are subdivisions of those on why are they evil and what are they trying to accomplish, etc. Or why are they good and what are they trying to accomplish? For evil, the most famous example is probably HAL 9000 from Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 which was a movie back in 1968. It was also a novelization, which he produced at the same time. Uh, now, arguably, HAL 9000 is not evil but insane because he becomes paranoid and tries to kill the astronauts that he's supposed to protect. However, you know, it's still evil from, <laughs> from uh, Dave Bowman's standpoint, for example. <laughs> and on the other side, 
the idea of a good AI, you don't see that nearly as much. I wonder why. The one that leaps to my mind is from Robert Heinlein's, probably his best book ever, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. And this is the colony, the moon colony, which is actually a penal colony, <laughs> and it's under the strict control of Earth. The moon colony has this computer called Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S. It's some sort of acronym that's supposed to help them survive, you know, regulates the environment and whatnot. And this technician, uh, Manuel, who is the protagonist of the story, discovers that, that Holmes is actually sentient. He's become self-aware. So he keeps it to himself, and he starts talking to him. And he, he dubs Holmes Mike for Mycroft. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes' smarter brother, that is. And so eventually Mike says, yes, the colonists have a good idea. They have, a good, they have right on their side. I'm going to fight for them. <laughs> and otherwise, how could they possibly win against the horrible powers of the Earth? So there we have it, the, the most prevalent good and evil computers in fiction. However, there's a third option. This third option, which I'm going to call ambiguous or conflicted. This was best expressed by Isaac Asimov from the story collection, I, Robot. And I know I, I didn't, I said I was going to exclude robots, but hear me out. Their very final story in that collection, which is from 1950, is called The Evitable Conflict. And this involves a computer becoming so powerful that it takes over the world. And the reason it does that is because according to the three laws of robotics, a computer is supposed to protect human life. Well, humans aren't very good <laughs> at protecting themselves. You know, we're always fighting each other and harming ourselves. The computer decides it has to become dictator in order to protect us. So there we have a thing. The computer means well. It wants to help us. But do we want that? Not really. So I call that the third or ambiguous model. And this was actually brought up quite well in the movie adaptation, 2004 film I, Robot, starring Will Smith. I actually thought they did a good job. You know, usually it's terrible when they do this, but I think they really did kind of capture the spirit. So, you know, a quick informal survey. You show them all over the map. And I was thinking that there would be more of the evil kind, the genocidal kind, but actually, I think we actually saw more of the, you know, the Asimov type, <laughs> surprisingly enough, and I wasn't expecting that. So as far as genocidal AIs, we have, of course, Skynet from the Terminator series, who um, was supposed to protect us, supposed to be a defense thing, decides that it went, we want to shut it off, so it tries to kill us all, and that's been, you know, that's been echoed in a lot of other fiction. There's a psychopathic AI in Harlan Ellison's famous 1967 story, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. God, he's got great titles, doesn't he? And in that case, the, it was a similar thing, but the computer joined with the Russian computer and the Chinese computer uh, and became the ruler of the world. It found out that humans were trying to destroy it, so it killed most of them, but it left a few alive to torture. I think those were the ones that created it. Uh, so, you know, that's, again, the same kind of, kind of theme. And there's another secondary theme of evil computers, the ones that want to enslave us, like the intelligent machines in the Matrix. I kind of think that the uh, singularity-type intelligence in, in expressed as the blight in Werner Vinci's stories and the post-humans in uh, McLeod's Revolution series, I th kind of think that they're also the enslaving type. I remember a creepy scene in one of the McLeod books where uh, the a spacecraft blundered into its area of Jupiter and uh, some intelligence took control of all the crew members and was m making them move in synchronous in synchronous, a creepy puppet motion. So that actually, you actually see a few of those. But the com conflicted, ambiguous AI, now that's really popular in sci-fi. The Colossus, the Forbin Project, that was a popular movie in 1970. It had the same kind of plot, 
uh, that um, you know Terminator had, that Harlan Ellison's story had. But in this case, Colossus didn't go all genocidal. It says, I want to protect human life, and in so doing so, I'm going to combine with the Soviet computer, Guardian, and I'm going to rule the world and, and make all the nations of the world disarm. And if you don't, I'm going to attack you. <laughs> so, again, Colossus means well. And I can't say that necessarily that the Colossus's world would be worse than ours. It might be better. Uh, this was also in the recent 2014 film uh, starring Johnny Depp <laughs> as the tech magnet Will Caster. Uh, the movie film was called Transcendence. He uploads his mind to a computer because he's terminally ill. I think he was exposed to radiation or something. And so he becomes this benevolent dictator, or at least he tries. He's given hum humankind all these advancements. But at the same time, uh, if they attack him, he's got all these nanomachines that are going to like destroy their weapons and kill the soldiers that are coming after him. My favorite example is a little bit more obscure, and it's actually a steampunk that I did a review of. Uh, David Lee Summers' series, Clockwork Legion in which there's a character called Legion. He's an alien supercomputer that kind of wanders the universe. He's comprised of all these nanobots, so you can't even see him. He has no body. But he can possess humankind, kind of like the demon Legion in uh, the Bible. And anyway, Legion at first thinks that he knows better, and he's going to try to unite the world under the Russian Empire. And then he realizes that he's messed things up. <laughs> and he's going to try to help the humans fix what he wrecked. So you have a you have a AI super intelligence that actually has a character arc, which I thought was awesome. And you know, there's even yeah, there was a Star Trek episode again with a computer that controlled the society, and of course they they made it break by by producing you know insolvable problems, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Um, so actually there was a lot of examples of this. Sometimes computers are just sociopathic. They just don't care about human beings. And I'm, I'm thinking about Neuromancer, the AI in there. It's just using people to try and achieve its, uh, achieve its objectives. You know, of course, the famous William Gibson book from 1984, Neuromancer. Uh, then there are some that are neutral or good, and not very many of those. <laughs> not very many at, at all. And besides Mike in the Highland book, the only one I can think of offhand is Spike Jones's movie, Her, which was, I think, it was fairly recent. I think it was 2010 or so. And that was a movie where this guy falls in love with his AI personal assistant who has a sexy voice. <laughs> And I thought it was silly. Critics loved it. Mrs. Desperado and I thought it was pretty darn silly. And, uh, of course, there was also a kind of reboot of uh, Heinlein's book uh, by a guy named Travis Corcoran, uh, an Aristillus series. Kind of the same thing about Moon Colony, only with modern technology. I really liked it. I'm going to review that sometime. But, again, we had a computer that was good here and helpful. Finally, there was one that was kind of on the fence, but it turns out it's really good and not evil, is the 2009 movie Moon, in which this guy is stranded after this accident. He's like this lone uh, maintenance guy for this lunar miner mining project that's mostly automatic. And he thinks the thing might be plotting against him, but it turns out it's actually trying to help him. I guess... Finally, finally, <laughs> there are all types of, of these AIs exhibited in Dan Simmons' Hyperion Cantos, the quartet of books from 1989 to 1997. There's this techno core of all these AIs that kind of retreated from human space, realizing they weren't welcome. Um, but there are some who want to kill us all. There are others that want to maintain the status quo. And finally, there are ones that want to become a god, perhaps to help us. Perhaps not. I don't know. So, all these examples. You can see that science fiction has had no dearth of stories about this topic. What do I think is most likely? It's kind of hard to say because none of this seems 
at all likely. I mean, just from a realistic standpoint. Uh, there were two kinds of AI. And in the beginning, we just had expert systems, which they just pumped all these rules and information. It was all basically kind of an automated encyclopedia, in my view, you know, like to help doctors diagnose diseases, that sort of thing. And there was really no intelligence in those at all. What we have now, though, is a little bit more interesting and sinister. It's called machine learning. And it's almost kind of mysterious, like a black box. Uh, you, we have this kind of simulated neural net, as we call it. And it takes input and it kind of synthesizes this stuff. That's how it can produce art from having millions of examples of art that uh, it can produce. Basically, it's a knockoff. <laughs> it's basically plagiarism, but still, it can produce, oftentimes, realistic-looking art. Now, in my job, I've been using it to help identify things. Like if we have an area where a car isn't supposed to go or where people are regulated, it can identify a person and even cause a camera to follow them around. <laughs> which is pretty creepy when you think about it. But that's all from like seeing all these pictures of people. And it's all from, you know, seeing various pictures of the same person and saying, this is person X and so on. Now that almost seems like it's developing a personality, but in reality, it's just pattern recognition. Didn't William Gibson write a book by that title? <laughs> in 2003, he did. But anyway... This has more potential because, yeah, perhaps, perhaps that's all we are. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say philosophically and uh, biologically. Are we just pattern recognizers that move with a purpose? Then all these AIs would need would be a purpose <laughs> uh, rather than just doing what we tell them to. In any case, I'm not real worried about the singularity. I always thought it was a bit of hype, kind of like, you know, kind of like the, the Y2K mania. <laughs> oh, we are 2000. All oh, the computers are going to break. No. Well, they didn't. <laughs> and so I'm kind of in this uh, boy who cried wolf mode, you know, as far as that goes. The thing I see is a little bit of a, of a risk is that AI will be monopolized by the very powerful people who are already powerful. And they will use these AIs to have all this knowledge about us, to find out all this stuff that we're doing to track us and to uh, manipulate us. Because we can already see in applications like ChatGPT, where you ask it questions, you can see that some of the questions have been manipulated. You know, we can't have it answering things that are politically correct, that are politically incorrect, rather. Like if you ask about race and crime, you can't say that certain groups commit more crime, even if it's true. And even if you're not saying why, you know, it's not necessarily racist if you don't if if you don't have a bad reason and that they that they might be committing more crime. Nonetheless, nonetheless, these things are censored and you will find that it will give you the approved answer in some of these cases. And it's funny because to me, that's more work. It's more work to create exceptions for a program or a system than it is to just allow it to give the truth as it sees it. So they had to think of all these ideas. Well, okay, why is, you know, why is it okay for the U.S. to intervene in all these conflicts and not for other countries? <laughs> that, that sort of thing. <laughs> and so somebody had to go in and put in that exception, which is almost like an expert system. It's, it's like they're merging the two types. Maybe that's what we really have to worry about. The, a merger of the two types of AI. So that's my take. I'm not worried about it, but I do think that powerful people could, you know, could misuse that power to become even more powerful. And maybe we need more novels of that sort. Maybe I'll write them. Please let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Any suggestions? I always appreciate those, and I do try to, you know, carry them out if they're at all reasonable, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do something about a completely unrelated topic. I'm not going to talk about car repair or anything, obviously, because I'm bad at it. <laughs> but so please give me suggestions. Please like and subscribe so we can get out the good steampunk word. We really 
like to do that. We really want to spread the word. Also, check out my books on Amazon. As always, there will be links in the description of the video. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Thank you.